We've been growing at such like a, a rapid exponential rate. It's been like 50% year over year that you really start to ask yourself, like, is this going to stop? Is this going to stop? Or are we just going to continuing? We're just going to continue to grow at this, this rate. So it's been fun. All right. And just like that, we are back again with the Mind the Growth podcast. As always, I am Chris Kinghorn. And I'm Eric Hoffman. Eric, and today we are joined by a very special bug killing guitar playing man of the uh, man of the Chai Town now these days. Ryan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, fellas. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as a side note, Ryan, I happen to know one of the McNeely clan, Mr. Matthew, uh, older brother of yours, as far as I'm aware. We went to high school together, friends of friends. So uh, welcome, because the McNeely clan is large. And Matt, Matt's the man. He just got uh, he got married pretty recently here, so super excited for him. But that's awesome. Yeah, there's a good chance that uh, people listening here know at least one of yeah. the McNeelys. <laughs> awesome. That's for well, sure. for, well, for those of you who are not within the, the Eco Shield community, and if you are, make sure to comment and like the video. We want to hear your feedback. Uh, Ryan, can you give us just a quick little background of who you are? For sure. So I uh, was born and raised in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, played uh, played youth hockey in the Valley growing up. I played junior hockey from the ages of 18 to 20 uh, after I graduated high school from, from Desert Mountain. I, I bounced all over the place. I was in Alaska, Texas, uh, Minnesota for a bit. And then I came back to Arizona late 2014. Uh, that's when I enrolled in Arizona State. Uh, I went to college for a few years. And it was there that I got recruited to the door-to-door -door industry, um, which I'm, I'm assuming we'll, we'll dive in a little bit more there um, as, as time goes on here. But uh, yeah, the rest, is, the rest is kind of history after that. Nice. So door-to-door -door sales, that's a tough gig. Are we talking EcoShield or was this a preamble to EcoShield? Yeah, good question. Uh, I actually wasn't going to bring this up because it's kind of confusing. But my first, uh, my first year, I actually sold for a different company, uh, Vivint Home uh, Home Security Home Automation, um, Smart Homes is is what I was selling. So I was going door to door in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, and Clarksville, Tennessee, back in 2015, just slinging alarms. And uh, my manager at the time made the jump to EcoShield in 2016, and uh, as a you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed new guy to the industry. I just hitched my wagon onto that guy and followed him. So <laughs> that's awesome. So I happen to have Vivint. And so I know the, I know the experience. Um, oh, let's go. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I do too. So tell me, tell us a little about that experience. Cause Vivint, it's a large company. Most people know about it now. Um, but I think hearing a little bit about that experience will give us a good launching pad into what you're doing at EcoShield. Yeah, it's it's funny because the uh, the the rec the recruiting to the door to door space on ASU campus is like a, a pretty well known thing now. But back then it wasn't. Um, and I was just walking campus one day, heading to class, and some random dude taps on my shoulder and starts pitching me this opportunity, asking me if I want to make a bunch of money knocking doors, selling security system, selling security systems. Uh, and my best man at my wedding in November put it best, uh, Frenchy, you know him, uh, Chris, but, uh, he's like, if that isn't the adult version of, Hey kid, do you want some candy? <laughs> uh, I don't really know what is. Yeah. So, uh, long story short, I was broke. Uh, I was super skeptical at first, but, um, the potential to make some, some good dough, um, really caught my eye and my, my gut told me to give it a shot. So I went out that summer to, to Huntsville, Alabama. I made um, as a young broke college kid, I made like 45 grand in, in a quick three months. So I was hooked, uh, dropped out of college, committed all my time and effort to building a door-to-door -door empire. Nice. So f 45 grand, that's, that's pretty good in terms of an annualized salary. Uh, so after that three months, was that when your manager switched over to EcoShield and you followed suit? Is that when that occurred? Yep. So he, he knew some guys that were over at EcoShield that had kind of been in his ear for the past few selling seasons. And uh, we got back to Arizona after, after that first summer. And uh, he was going to, to Top Golf to meet up with these guys. And he's like, hey, I want you to tag along here. And I kind of become his right hand man. And um, we met good dudes. He thought it was the right move. So I was like, let's do it. I'll, I'll sell wherever. Nice. 
Nice. So when you, can you give us a little bit of a uh, walk through the journey through that kind of from not necessarily to where you're at now, but so you started with EcoShield and then what is, you know, fast forward a year after that, two years, kind of what, what was that process like? Yeah. So it's, uh, I guess I'll just kind of give you like a, a breakdown of, of the business and kind of how it works for, for the listener's sake. Uh, it's a, it's a production based industry, which is really unique because, uh, it's not really a business where you, you can see these, you know, VCs coming in with, you know, a big bankroll, a bunch of capital and, and just come in and have success. Uh, it, it's a franchise of sorts and, uh, we have 20 plus branches uh, nationally. I'm partial owner in, in four of those. Uh, you just, everyone starts as a sales rep. If you do well enough uh, at selling, you get promoted to, to management. And then once you're in management, if you recruit a big enough team and you hit a certain production benchmark, you actually get uh, a piece of the company. So they bring you into like the ownership of the business and you get to take a, a piece of profits. Um, so that happened for me back in 2017. And uh, the, the models changed a bit since then. But, but now uh, once, you know, once a, a sales manager in our organization and their team collectively produces $1.5 million in revenue, we literally hand them over a piece of the business and, and teach them, you know, the, the behind the scenes stuff. So it's, it's, it's been really cool. That's awesome. So can you walk us through kind of the location of, of your offices and kind of what type of, I don't know how much you can share on the financial side, but kind of what type of numbers you guys are doing? For sure. Yeah. So, um, most of my time is spent in Chicago. Um, it's kind of our flagship branch. It's been around the longest, um, we're the, the highest producing team this summer and, and have been for a few summers past. Uh, I'm also an owner in our Detroit branch, our Milwaukee branch, and our Philadelphia branch. Milwaukee and Philly, we just opened this past year. Um, but yeah, the, the numbers, it's totally dependent on the market, but uh, it's been crazy. Like, I need to give you some context here. So in 2016, uh, which was my rookie year with EcoShield, um, in, in Chicago, our best day that summer, uh, collectively, we sold like $60,000 in revenue in, in one day, which was awesome back then. Um, this year in Chicago, uh, we're, we're consistently selling around $170,000 in revenue. And that's, that's a combination of a lot of things as to why that, that growth has that's been exponential, daily? but that's, those are daily numbers. Yeah. Awesome. So it's, it's, it's crazy. Cause, uh, those, those daily numbers surpass some of our weekly numbers from back in 2016. But um, yeah, I guess in terms of numbers, like what specifically, any, any follow-up questions there? No, no, that, that, I mean, I think you did a good job providing context of, you know, what it was originally versus kind of what it is now. Um, and sure. is that is, so you had mentioned that the Chicago office, that's the top producing office. As of this year. Yes. Um, our, our Detroit branch, uh, they also produce a ton of revenue. Uh, Philly and Milwaukee, those are those are startups per se. Um, we've kind of got it down to a science when we go start a new branch, but uh, this is this is the first summer that they've existed. This is uh, you know the inception year for those branches, and and they're doing very very well too. So depending on a lot of different factors, sometimes you know you hit profit within um, six months. Sometimes it takes three years, and there's a lot of factors that go into it. But uh, you know we're we're hoping to to spin over some profit here in the next. 12 months with those new branches. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it sounds like you picked the warm places too, which is nice. Yeah, we, uh, we love the Midwest. At least for the summer. Yeah, at least. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we love the Midwest, started in Chicago, obviously branched off to, to Detroit after that and kind of fell in love with the Midwest. So we're staying as close as we can branching off now, uh, into the East coast with Philly. And that's, that's been a bit of a learning curve because when you're knocking on doors and you're selling homeowners, uh, there's different cultural dynamics in different parts of the country, right? So it's been it's been an adjustment, but um, our, our boys are bouncing back very, very well in Philly. So uh, g- taking a step back into the numbers for a second here, uh, you mentioned early on with Vivint in like three months, you made about 45 grand, which annualized about 180 grand if you were to continue that path for a year. So when you moved over to EcoShield, was it as quick for you personally to, you know, earn that level of income or was it more of a, a slower rise, but, you know, a bigger upside? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, for me, uh, it was, I, I produced a lot more the following year than I did my, my first year at, at Vivint. And I think that was for a number of reasons, but 
it, it's a little bit different. So in alarms, at least back in the day, it's changed now, but uh, it was less volume with alarms, but you were paid more sales commission per deal. And in pest okay. control, it was an easier sale, but you made less, uh, you made less commissions per deal. And that's kind of changed now, the evolution of the industry. Um, they're actually pretty comparative now. But uh, I, I, w- I would say that um, our sales reps now are making much more than our sales reps were back in 2016. So I, I would guess the reason for that, at least in the past, was alarm systems. That's a really sticky business. It's really hard to, to churn out at that. You're pretty much locked into an alarm once you get it. So with uh, EcoShield, how have you been able to, if you have, be, uh, replicate that type of stickiness um, in the business model? Yeah, and I, you know, there's definitely not as much stickiness, and I think there's there's a little bit of beauty in that. Like, there's a lot of teeth in an alarm contract, as you know. You said yeah. you're, you said you had a event. You wanted to cancel yeah. that thing. You're, you're paying a. I, I'm in for life. Yeah, you're in for, <laughs> yeah. You're in for life. Uh, with with uh, with pest control, it's it's way less invasive. It's uh, you know anywhere from a, a 12 to 24 month contract that we're signing people up for. We come out and we spray their home for bugs. Uh, you know every every two or three months. And if for any reason they do want to cancel, there's no hefty fee. You're not paying the remainder of your contract or anything like that. It's just a, a small fee that they pay to break their contract and, and they're out. So um, I think I think the result of that from uh, the, the, the sales force side of things is we end up retaining a lot more reps in the pest control industry than the teams did in the alarm industry back in the day because it's a lot easier of a sales process. Uh, you know, if you, if, if guys go out with zero sales experience and they go work for eight hours a day and pound on, you know, 150 doors and find 50 homeowners that are home, they're going to find at least one or two people that, uh, hate bugs and, and want them gone. So, um, there's a lot more sticky stickiness there on our, on our sales side and retaining reps, which, which is obviously huge for the future of the business. Sure. Sure. So, uh, one additional question to that is, does that mean you really focus on volume versus, you know, having a customer last as long as possible? And the second part to that is, let's say I was a, a new sales rep coming in and I wanted to get the most bang for my my effort. Uh, would I be looking towards more trying to target enterprise clients or more, uh, you know, single family homeowners? Definitely single family. So we don't really dabble in the commercial space, at least not yet. Okay. Um, we're, you know, as a, as a business we're we've professionalized everything a ton these past few years. And, uh, that's, that's one of the things we're looking into, but yeah, our, our door to door sales team, they're out in, you know, neighborhoods in the suburbs and gotcha. they're, they're, they're slinging, uh, you know, single family homes and there's, uh, you know, there's really no perfect customer because everybody has bugs and everybody wants them gone. Uh, which is again the beauty in the business, right? Because we can send guys to every single suburb in uh, in the metro areas of all four of those markets. Perfect. Well, that makes sense, um, Ryan. Just out of curiosity, and, and again, I don't know if you can share, share this or not, but what's your guys' churn like? You know, how frequently do you have a customer that signs up that decides that they no longer want to utilize your guys' service? That's something that's huge for us. We've in my in my business, we've really put a lot of focus on retaining customers and I know how important that is. So just curious of what that looks like for you guys. No doubt. So it's always a work in progress, right? When you're in the service industry, mm-hmm. um, you know, your your customers are your number one asset and you want to keep as many of them as possible. That being said, it is the service industry and people are going to cancel their services from time to time. So uh, we aim to be under under two percent monthly and um, I feel like we do a pretty good job of that and we're getting better and better at that. Anytime you put on a, a, a ton of volume in a short period of time um, with, you know, as, as good as our salesmen are, right. um, so you'll get some unhappy customers here and there, but you know, it's, it's all part of the process there. And uh, our, our, uh, our cancellations definitely go up during the summertime because of that, you know, massive, massive volume that we're doing. But yeah, the the other eight months of the year, our our uh, our goal is usually to stay under that two percent mark of customers that we're losing on a monthly basis. So, uh, I I'm gonna propose a game. We're gonna play real quick, Ryan. Sure. <laughs> let's pretend. Do it. Let's let's pretend I'm a broke college kid walking down uh, Palm Walk at ASU, and uh, you see me. You're like, this is the guy I'm gonna go after. I'm gonna recruit him. What do you do? What do you tell me? 
what do you what do you do to sink your teeth into me to make me feel like i'm gonna make a shitload of money yeah i love it uh so i'd see you I'd see you cruising down Palm Walk and probably stop you right in your tracks and, uh, <laughs> you know, pro- probably a couple questions first. Be like, hey, how's it going, man? I'd, I'll be super quick with you. Uh, what, I'm Ryan. What was your name? Oh, my name's Eric. I'm a freshman here. <laughs> Eric, man, I love it. Hey, uh, I know you probably got to get to class, but I'll be I'll be really quick with you. Um, I'm actually out here looking for some young driven dudes that are, uh, you know, in the business school, potentially looking for some extra cash this summer. Um, I, I've got a, a long winded explanation, but, uh, put simply anybody that's, that's willing to come on and, and work with us this summer has a potential to make, you know, 30 to, to 50 grand. Um, really, really, really hard work, but you, you look like somebody that presents yourself pretty well. And I'd love to at least, you know, buy you lunch and, and share a little bit of the details with you. Let me, uh, let me just grab your, your number really quick. So is this like, a, like an OnlyFans type of gig or what, what are we talking here? Depends. How nice are your feet? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pretty good. I've gotten a few compliments. At the, you you at just the got a fresh SRC. pedicure, so you're, you're good to go. Yeah. It's funny you ask that because that's how I was recruited. And um, I really don't do a ton of first degree recruiting anymore not because i don't want to just because uh you know my my bandwidth is only you know so so big and i a a ton of my time and effort is put into building that that layer underneath me with all my sales managers and and helping them through a lot of stuff so uh recruiting guys you know first degree for me would be the easy part but continuing to put in the effort to train those guys uh, while, you know, having a, a lot of other things on my plate, um, at the end of the day, kind of just sounds like an, ex- an excuse on my end, but, um, that's, that's why I, I don't recruit my first degree network quite as much as I was back in, you know, 2016, 2017, when I was building that first layer of, of my network. Sure. And so it, let's say I come in, I make, I make that 50 grand and I'm watching somebody like you who's in, you know, a good position today. Are you, as a company, pretty transparent about, you know, what the possibilities are with that? Because you mentioned it's a pretty clear path to, you know, ownership, essentially. And so would a would a person like me coming in for a summer making, you know, 30 to 50 grand or whatever it is, what what would you tell me if I asked you what what's possible for me in a few years? How do I get to your place? What do you actually you know make or take home in terms of an income if that's how it's situated or if it's more of an equity base? How how would how would you present that? And if it's not comfortable, that's fine too. No, but, yeah, no, it's fine. Um, so I get, I guess it depends. It depends on who's asking me. If if a if a first year sales rep, if a rookie is asking me that question. Uh, my answer is really simple. I tell him uh, your first step is to sell $100,000 in revenue this summer, and that gets you inducted into our management development program where we teach you how to recruit, manage, train your own team, and then we can start to have those talks of what the future looks like. Um, if one of my managers comes to me with that question, then I kind of paint out what you know the, the next few years could look like if they wanted to go you know, recruit a massive team of their own. Um, if they have aspirations of, you know, hitting partnership, hitting that $1.5 million mark and, uh, earning a piece of the business and all the added responsibilities that come with that. Um, and then the fun part, all of the perks and compensation that comes with that. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess the the simple answer is it, it depends who's asking me that question. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. So I guess shifting a little bit away from the kind of the day to day. Um, obviously your involvement has changed over time and you've kind of expressed how, you know, people's involvement can progress throughout time as well too. So where do you, where and how do you see your involvement in the next three to five years? What's, what's the most ideal situ idealistic situation for you? It's a good question because it's, it's just hard to tell. I think, I think within the next five years, we'll probably have I think with uh, with my my partnership group, probably ten to fifteen locations, um, a ton of experience managers, partners. It's hard to say, but uh, we've been we've been growing at such like a, a rapid exponential rate. It's been like fifty percent year over year that you really start to ask yourself like, is this going to stop? Is this going to stop? Or are we just going to continuing 
we're just going to continue to grow at this this rate. So it's been fun, but uh, my goal is really simple. Like I just want to make all my my like I, my little brothers work with me. Um, one of my older brothers work with me. A bunch of you know family friends work with me. A bunch of my little brothers best friends work with me. My goal is really simple. I just want to make them all really rich. Like money isn't right. everything, but it sure does give you a lot of options and it allows you to take care of the people that you love. And I think that does bring happiness. So I just, uh, yeah, my, my, my goal, my objective, I, you know, I've made enough money where, um, I'm comfortable. I can live the life I want to live. And I, I just want to provide that for, for my boys now. I love it. Cool. So, with the the ownership structure, I know you have you know several partners within you know the few locations that you co own. With somebody who's producing a lot, uh, is the structure set up such that if somebody's doing well and becomes a, another co owner, that obviously dilutes everyone else. But is the growth that they bring enough to offset that dilution? Does that make sense? What I'm asking for sure. Yeah, and of course it does. Yeah, it wouldn't make any any sense on our end um, to bring in more partners if they weren't. So the way it works is it's, you know, it's all production based. As I mentioned, mentioned before this, this whole industry is production based. So um, when they're hitting certain uh, production benchmarks, that's when they earn their partnership. That's when they get uh, different kinds of perks. So with our partnership plan, once you do get a piece of the business, it comes with a lot of different things. So you get, you know, a company phone, you get, uh, you know, a car allotment, put on the insurance plan. So there's a lot of things that uh, get, you know, get put on your plate once you do hit that title of being a partner of the business. And it's always worth it on our end because uh, one, it's, it's, you know, bringing in more revenue. Two, it's, you know, developing those sales managers into sales partners, which just gives them a, you know, a, a higher title that also comes with a lot of, a lot more responsibility. So, um, I hope that answered the question adequately. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that may, yeah absolutely. Especially the dilution piece in the in the production base, that, that totally makes sense. Um, all right, so moving to, I guess before we hit some funny questions, hardest part of the business and most rewarding part of the business? I'd, I'd say the most challenging part of the business uh, as of late is just hiring the labor required to keep up with the sales production. It's it's been really difficult for a lot of our different markets to to find people that want to work a you know sixteen to to twenty dollars an hour uh, hourly wage job. Uh, it's it's really really difficult and it's uh, it's it's hard to hire and it's hard to keep guys on, especially when you know they're out in the uh, the ninety degree heat with ninety percent humidity in the suburbs in the summertime, dripping sweat, killing bugs. And, uh, some guys are, some guys love doing that. Some guys don't love doing that. So it's a challenge on our end to, to find, you know, the right pieces to that puzzle. So I would say the labor has definitely been our, our, uh, our most challenging aspect of the job these past couple summers. Gotcha. No, that, that's totally understandable. All right. So how, what, when, when, what, uh, what was the first year you were involved with EcoShield? Oh, wait, I'm going to back up and answer, uh, I think you, the most rewarding, rewarding part of the job. Piece. Yeah. I want to answer that one. Um, so this one's easy. Like, there's nothing I love more. I've been doing this for eight years now, which uh, you know, your first few years in the your first few years in the business, it's uh, you know, everything's kind of new. But once you've been in it for eight years, like I've got you know, I've got a lot of history to look out there and a lot of data to pull and a lot of guys that have come in, into the system. My favorite thing by far is, you know, we've had so many 18, 19 year old kids come into our system that are timid, shy, super introverted. And after working with us for three years, you wouldn't even recognize them anymore. Uh, it, it's crazy. They have like after three years of working with us, managing their own team, uh, you know, recruiting, training that team, uh, personally producing and raising those numbers year by year the confidence that comes with all of that completely changes their persona. And, you know, you take these, these once 18 year old, now 21 year olds are walking around like their shit don't stink and all the confidence in the world, um, financial, having a ton of financial options, 
and uh, just just way better men. We you know we've got a lot of core principles to help you know serve other people, and and you know they embody all of that stuff. So it's really cool to just see you know that that young moldable type of sales rep that comes into our system and just watch them turn into a, a, a way better version of themselves. That's my favorite part of the job by far. No, that's, that's huge. I could totally appreciate that as well. So we, we've established that you've done well, you've, you've made some money for yourself. And when people, uh, you know, in our demographic, our age range, make some money, we, we want something to do with it. <laughs> so <laughs> what do you do with your money? Do you invest it? Are you into crypto? What's, what's your situation currently? Yeah. So, uh, do we hit on crypto or real estate first? <laughs> so, uh, I guess we'll go real estate first and save the fun stuff for last. But, um, with the real estate stuff, honestly, I'm, I'm as hands off as possible with that. Like that's, personally, uh, I, I want to put all of my time and effort into my business for the most part. So when I'm investing in real estate, a lot of times I, I want to do stuff that, um, I don't have to do a lot of the, the legwork. So, um, I've done some investing in, um, Western wealth capital. Um, uh, my buddy, Austin Carroll, he, uh, he helps raise funds for them and, um, they buy, you know, not even like low level, but kind of mid-level apartment complexes. And then they do this value add program where they, you know, change up the, the cosmetics of the buildings and make it, you know, a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. They add washers and dryers to each unit. They neutralize rents and usually make a three or five year exit with those buildings. So that's been awesome. Uh, totally hands off. I don't do a thing. He sends me reports uh, like once every few months on, on the properties that I'm invested in. They do like a, a distribution every November. And uh, I've been a part of one property that uh, I entered went through the three-year process, sold, got some money back. Uh, I think I think they, they averaged some crazy numbers, like 30% annually on their building. So that's an amazing investment to be hands-off with. And then uh, with real estate, it's, it's, it's not about what you know, it's who you know, in my opinion, because I have some people that I trust in my life that have pointed me in the right direction. One of my business partners um, at EcoShield, a guy named Mike Sautel, he is – uh, a, a savant with real estate and um, he's always wheeling and dealing and uh, he's, he had a ton of Airbnb, Airbnbs. So once I got a little bit of dough, uh, him, myself, and one of our other business partners uh, started a little real estate company of our own and we've just been gobbling up properties and turning them into Airbnbs. Um, obviously a ton of uh, tax benefits there for us as business owners to do that. So um, I've learned so much along the way and um, I, I think the reason that that's happened is because, uh, I've just been very, very inquisitive with investing. Like if I don't understand something, I'm going to, I'm going to come at you until I understand it. Like I'm going to, I'm going to ask follow-up question after follow-up question. Like I'm a, like a, a five-year-old, like learning, you know, the ABCs, I guess that's probably not when you're five, probably a little younger, but <laughs> you see my point. We'll have to enter. Depends on the kid. Yeah, exactly. We'll have to introduce <laughs> you to the, uh, we did the FSO capital guys, uh, a little bit earlier this year. Shout out, uh, John, uh, Scotty and, uh, Jeff, and, uh, we've got a good buddy that built some apartments in Vegas, Mikey. So we'll have to make some introductions that way you can get whipped into our little real estate ecosystem as well. Yeah. Yeah. Always happy to meet some new faces. Cool. So, all right. Nice. Eight years. Before we before we get into crypto and NFTs, and then I know you're a sneaker guy as well too, and I've, I've got one question real quick. Oh yeah, when was the last time that you door knocked? So I knocked doors from like May fifteenth, twenty fifteen, uh, all the way up until August thirty first of twenty twenty. So during the summer months from uh, May to August, uh, every single day besides Sundays for those six years uh i was i was knocking doors all right it's a lot of doors a lot of <laughs> doors yeah got to uh you know got to got to get it done personally before you can start you know teaching the boys what to do so had to had to lead the lead from the front for a few years and uh happily pass the torch i think crypto's next <laughs> what's your opinions what are you doing what are you dabbling in so i'm way 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 more versed in nfts than i am crypto so i don't know what your guys is uh, knowledge is on that, but uh, my best friend, uh, the best man at my wedding, 
Frenchie, I, I mentioned him earlier. Uh, he's huge into crypto. So I know that he does a ton of research. This is coming back to my thought earlier. It's not about what you know, it's about who you know. I just like have people that I trust in all these different buckets of investing with real estate, crypto. Um, and I kind of took NFTs over myself, but uh, he he got me into Bitcoin in 2017 and I held for a while. I made I made a good amount of money on crypto and I sold at a really good time. So uh, happy about that. He did not. <laughs> so he's uh, he, he's in the hole a bit, but he's still up overall. Um, honestly, with crypto, um, I'm not a big like altcoin guy. Uh, I think I threw a little bit of cash into like Doge when it was pumping and that was just fun. Just reading Twitter blow up. But uh, other than that, I'm, I'm mainly just like a Bitcoin, Ethereum guy. I, I love Ethereum because I love NFTs. So uh, that's that's usually where I'm putting my money if I'm putting it into some very volatile investments. How, how about you guys? I, I th- I'm into everything. So I... I'm not as big into NFTs personally in terms of investing in them. I got I got a little burned early on when they were st- just starting to come up. What was it? Early 2021 yeah. when there was a huge craze building. And I got into the uh, NBA Top Shot group. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I, cer- I certainly bought at the top and I bought like very rare ones because i figured that's the way to go and yeah they're not worth what i paid so <laughs> we'll see maybe 10 years from now uh yeah. I, I don't have any th- any plan to get rid of them but well, if it makes you feel better everyone is in the hole now with nfts yeah because yeah, yeah the market as a <laughs> whole has crashed just like every other market but it's a it's a double-edged sword when ethereum tanks and the floor price of NFTs tank. Right. So you're exactly. just getting money pulled yeah. from, from both directions. Every direction. So yeah. I, feel your, I feel your pain. Yeah. And so mainly for me, I've always been into the underlying technology, which in this case would be Ethereum. I have probably 45% of my portfolio in Ethereum, maybe 30 to 35% in Bitcoin, and then the remainder just dabbling around in everything else. Um, but I'm curious for you with NFTs, since that's your main go-to, do you hold any of the, the blue chip ones or are you big on any projects in particular? Yeah. So it's been a, it's been a learning curve for sure. At first I was like, just buying a bunch of these, you know, low level brand new projects, hoping to, you know, go to the moon and 50 X my money overnight. Uh, that didn't happen. Pretty much all of those went to zero. So I took some losses and sold out. Um, I, it is it is a goal of mine to have some of the bigger blue chips. I don't know which ones yet. I think I want to think I want to hop into V Friends. Um, I don't I don't see myself justifying uh, buying a board ape for the utility. I just think it's impossible to to justify spending right now two hundred thousand dollars to get into this community to just say you own a board ape. So a lot of my a lot of my research in the space, which, you know, for anybody listening, it's it's such a wild, wild west type of environment in the NFT space right now. Uh, if if you are gonna invest in into NFTs, it it doesn't matter at all what like these people are promising, whatever their roadmaps are, whatever the art is, like the only thing I'm looking into is who is running the project. Um, what's, what's their background? What type of person are they? Um, you know, what's, what's, what's their history in business? Maybe they were in web two before they were in in web three. So, um, that's, that's what most of my research is when I'm choosing a project. I'm very bullish on this project called psychedelics anonymous. Um, they're super high on like mental health and, uh, like the, the form of treating mental health with like psychedelics and stuff like that. Um, for all of their holders, pretty soon they're launching a product that if you are a holder of a Psychedelics Anonymous NFT, um, you get free consulting with like a professional psychologist uh, via Zoom or something like that. So it's uh, I've done a ton of research on the market and it's my first project that I've come across that is actually launching like a, a good product, like a, a good product that Something is applicable, with utility. To them, especially right yeah, now, yeah. everybody depressed about all their losses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good timing. Sure. Are you familiar with a project called nouns? N O U N S. N O U N S. 
I've probably <laughs> seen them on like the the stats page, but um, I don't that know would anything be a good, about them. That would be a good one to look into. If I were to go for one of the like blue chip ones, that's probably what I would put my sights on. The it was started by a few, maybe five or six guys who were big in NFTs early. A lot of uh, crypto punk guys, a lot of board ape guys that got in early and made a bunch of money. And they started this project where it's an auction. One one noun per day is auctioned off. And, you know, forever is the plan. And every single one of them go for minimum 80 ETH right now. Wow. And so they've built a huge, huge war chest in terms of their treasury. They have a DAO attached to it. And they're doing a lot of really cool things. I, that's, I that's like amazing. the project a lot. It sounds pretty, yeah, so, it sounds kind of like, uh, I don't know if you guys keep up with uh, Logan Paul at all. He's a funny personality. Yeah, I don't the know originals. The, yeah, the originals. So similar thing. He's doing the auctions for those. I think he's brilliant. Like I think so much of what he does so, is, a, totally. is a facade. But like at, at the end of the day, I think he's a very, very smart, intelligent guy. And all of his moves are very calculated. He's an entertainer. That's how he. That's how he makes it. He is. Well, he's got the <laughs> following he's very too. It's, I agree. it's very helpful when you've got millions of people following you, and you can kind of pick and choose your business ventures and how you how For you approach sure. the. So, so Ryan, would you consider yourself a sneakerhead? Yes and no. Like I don't want people coming at me hard if they're listening and like <laughs> like drilling me on like some you know some some OG like PEs and stuff like that, but. I do love sneakers. I do have a ton of sneakers, probably over 150 pairs of sneakers. Um, and that's, you know, all different types of shoes. You got the, just the daily beaters. You've got a, you know, a bunch of like ultra boost, stuff like that. I, I, I'm a huge uh, Chuck Taylor guy. I love like the high top chucks, but um, I also have my fair share of some, some grails with some, some Jordan ones and the dunks are super popular. So I got, got a few pairs of those, but um, I think uh, I think my next big purchase on uh, the sneaker end of things is probably going to be uh, a pair of, like the the Travis Scott uh, highs, like the blue and the white and the black ones. Those have, those have caught my eye for a while now, so I think that's probably the next thing I'm pulling the trigger on. Time to do it. So, are you looking at these as collectibles, or are you looking at them as investments? Because I know some people look at it, look at look at them as investments. Others are, you know, they're just the shoes that I love, like wearing or, or holding on to. Yeah, I'm not expecting to like make some dough with it. At first, I kind of uh, dabbled with like the reselling, and I still am planning on on reselling a bunch of my shoes. My idea is like, hey, I put a bunch of money into sneakers up front. Now that allows me to, because I keep my shoes uh, pristine, right? Like they're all super clean. I I only wear each pair like once, you know, every month and a half or so. So after I wear them, I clean them up. So whenever I do decide that I want a new pair, I'll just sell you know, one of my old pairs. So that's, that's kind of my thing with it. I just want to have fun. I, I love shoes. I want my, in you know, my, my dream home that I eventually build. I want a nice, you know, full, uh, all four walls with, with some, uh, some shelving for the shoes and, and fill that, fill that beast up. I got it. I got into shoe reselling <laughs> at one time. It was a one and one and done gig. Yeah. I don't know if you recall when, uh, Nike and Supreme got together and they released, Supreme Jordans. Do you remember that? They came yeah, in white and black. Supreme's just been a nightmare. <laughs> so uh, this was, I don't know, 2015 or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, I I just figured this is probably going to be something people want. And I had, I knew nothing about shoes. I'm not a sneakerhead. Yeah. But I somehow got into the queue to buy a pair. I bought like a size 10 and a half. I'm like a size 9. So <laughs> they wouldn't even fit me. And I, I wound up getting them. And I sold them for like 600 bucks. I bought them for 150 on eBay. And I'm Let's like, go. all right, I'm out. I'm Let's out. Go. That's it. That's it. <laughs> One I'm win. Done. That's all I need. Like uh, I'm an official sneakerhead reseller. That's so that's, deep, that's my one quick, quick antidote. It's, anecdote a, lot of, it's a lot of effort to resell sneakers. And I learned that really quickly. I think it's an awesome thing for like, uh, you know, kids in high school and kids just looking to hustle, make a little bit of extra dough. Uh, what I what I love about sneakers is that that's what got me into like like Twitter world and like understanding Twitter and how you know Twitter operates and how to keep up on news and stuff like that, which eventually led me to NFTs. Which now that I'm thinking about it, ended up losing me way more money. So I guess I don't <laughs> like sneakers anymore. <laughs> no, I'm just messing. But it's uh, it's been fun. It's been a fun journey. Like the past probably 18 to 24 months, 
I've, I've opened up like a, a lot more creative side to like my, my day-to-day life and my purchases, which, which has just been fun because I've realized it's a, it's common ground for a lot of people. And I love just shooting the shit and chatting with people. So uh, a lot of times that'll spark up a conversation when I'm wearing a cool pair, pair of sneakers and somebody comments on them and we just start shooting the shit. And 20 minutes later, we're, we've had a, a sweet conversation and I got a new friend now. So that's, that's kind of why I do it. I enjoy it. So you brought up something interesting that I want to touch on. And then Chris has one last question. So Twitter, I love Twitter. It's my favorite social media platform. And uh, I've noticed something recently, which I'm not sure how involved on Twitter you are. But over the last couple of years, I, I, I'm more of an observer. I, uh, I interject where I, I want to. But there's different subsections of Twitter, as you probably know. There's the crypto Twitter. There's the VC Twitter. There's the tech Twitter. But more recently, I would say over the last year and a half or so, I've noticed the SMB, the small to mid-sized business Twitter, like explode. And so many people are now talking about, you know, buying and growing small to mid-sized businesses like pest control businesses, like HVAC businesses, like pool, you know, construction businesses, because they're just cash printing machines. And people don't typically think of them that way. And especially in like the tech world, people just want the the home run versus pretty much guaranteed cash. So are you noticing that? Are you involved in that? Have you <laughs> have you seen this kind of pop up, this phenomenon of SME here, Twitter? Here and there, you know how Twitter works. Like it's they've got their algorithm <clears throat> algorithms that whatever you're into and whatever you're retweeting and you're liking, that's what they're gonna throw in your feed. So as you can imagine, most of mine is just uh, NFT nonsense. Sure. Um, but I have seen it here and there. Uh, I mean, I'm a I'm I'm not very well versed in the space, but I. I think that uh, social media marketing and uh, just like the the idea of people getting their name out there on Twitter is such a valuable asset in in the world of business, especially with uh, Elon Musk taking over. Like, he, I think he's gonna he's gonna turn Twitter into a platform that's ten times better than what it currently is. He's gonna get all the bots out of there that are just like fake accounts spamming everybody. Um, so I think I think it uh, that Elon taking over on Twitter is going to favor that that uh, niche market right there with like the the small the small business and, and helping them grow. So I'm excited to see where it goes. Nice. I'll have to share a few a few accounts with you offline. Yeah, yeah. S- send them over. Interesting for yeah. sure. We lost Chris for a second. Maybe he'll jump back on. But uh, the the market's telling us that the Twitter deal might not go through, so we'll see. <laughs> we will see. I I think I think Elon will figure out a way to get it done. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. So Ryan, something that we ask everybody, <clears throat> um, this can be uh, this can be work wise, personal, whatever. However, you 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 react to this. Um, what does the word growth mean to you? Um, it's a good question. I think. I think growth at the end of the day just comes down to, you know, whatever your own aspirations are, right? Like if, if you're trying to, to get to a position financially that, you know, you're, you're striving for, then growth might be defined from a financial standpoint. If growth for you is, you know, maybe you're struggling with some, some mental health stuff and you just want to get dialed in for, you know, all things that come with health and wellness, then, you know, slow, gradual improvements of getting into the gym more or meditating more. I think that can be defined as growth. For for me personally, I think uh, I think growth comes in a lot of different categories. Like um, I, I, I focus a ton on growth in my relationships with my wife, and I just got married in November with my wife, and uh, you know, my family, making sure I maintain those relationships. But um, it's a it's a really good question. I think at the end of the day, just every single day try to just be a little bit better. Um, I talk about habits a ton with my sales organization and my sales manager. Um, whatever you know your day-to-day habits are and uh, whatever you strive for those habits to be, if you can just do those things 1% better every day, when you do a lot of the little things correctly, the big things kind of take care of themselves. So that's a huge thing that I preach. And, and at the end of the day, I think I think growth can be defined as 
just doing all the little things right in, in every facet of your life. Like good, answer. good answer. Shout out to uh, Atomic Habits, a great book by James Clear. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but it's an excellent am, yeah. book on habits. We've got a, we've got a, in our management development program, we've got a, for those eight months that we're not selling, um, we've got a book club and that's, that's always, that's always a favorite. So we, we usually crush, yeah, top of the list. We usually crush two books every month. So, um, nice. it's, it's been, it's been fun. Is the, is the Grant Cardone book in there or? T 10X. <laughs> yeah, 10X. <laughs> that's been in there a few times. There's been a lot of books over the past right. eight years that, that one's in there. Um, you know, all the all the, uh, the, the typical self-help books that you've ever read are, are def they, they've definitely been in our arsenal at one point, to say the least. <laughs> Perfect. Cool. Well, Ryan, thanks for joining us, man. This has been awesome. We've, uh, we really appreciate it. And for everyone still watching, make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe. Shout out to the EcoShield uh, community. And uh, yeah, it's been fun. Appreciate man. you guys yeah. having me, man. Awesome. We'll talk to you soon. Right, man. Have a good day, guys.